Thank you. So I want to talk about like why people are not just running into their doctor like, hold up, give me the answers. Why, why, why is that not happening across the board? What's stopping us? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> the million dollar question. <laughs> uh, you know, it all comes down to stigma, right? Um, and also, we, I, we were kind of getting into this before we walked into the studio, this idea of like, well, if it's not for me, then why sure. should I? Yeah. Or people will maybe think that I actually am positive if, I, if they knew I were taking it. So I think personally having, um, I'm not working at Maya's clinic, but personally having um, previous to uh, private practice, I was doing a graduate course with public health students and things. Um, and uh, all the research is kind of showing that um, when it comes to the black community specifically, there's certain subsects of us that are much more at risk. Like um, if you're in a small community that funnels in uh, from some of the bigger prison systems like San Quentin mm -hmm. or um, in certain areas of New York, you know, you're going to be more likely to have someone who went into a prison where they didn't have access to condoms or treatment come out, resume heteronormative practices around sex. And usually black women will feel more pressure to want to have unprotected sex. Let's mm -hmm. say if you have been single for a while, you want to have kids, mm -hmm. any of the reasons that um, any of us have had unprotected sex in our life. Uh, I think that's where we need to target and really, be, really say that it's not a marker against you to say, I like just a little extra mm -hmm. to protect myself and my body and my sexuality. Um, and then even when you give that education, unfortunately, it's not enough, though. And this is where the public health students always got it wrong and ended up spinning their wheels because public health teaches you to try and stop the epidemic, but not <laughs> what to do once you're in it. Um, you, it always comes down to intimacy because people can have education like I knew if I had unprotected sex, I could probably get HIV. Everybody has a story of something mm -hmm. like that who's a um, contracted it basically yeah. or I knew my partner may have had um, risky sex practices but you did it anyway and why is that because it comes yeah. down to a story about love or something like mm -hmm. I wanted them to trust me mm -hmm. or um, I'm getting a lot of pressure from my my immigrant family my Nigerian in-laws really want me to have a kid soon mm -hmm. if we're going to keep receiving support. Mm -hmm. So you have to get down to the why, the story for people, and make that less shameful. That, hmm, you know, even within this, you know, a couple that if you want to keep this relationship, it's like still all good. Yeah. Um, you can do that, and um, it doesn't have to bring shame to also have your health um, at the forefront. You can still get pregnant. You can still... Um, have unprotected sex with someone someone else and now you, the burden of your health is in, on what, what they're doing yeah. <laughs> with their time, uh, I think that's where we move. I hear, I'm hear i hearing normalcy to me. You know, you say remove the, the stigma of shame. Just normalizing the conversations so that we can speak for our lives. You know, Normalizing the conversation. Make, like, let's make honesty sexy. <laughs> Can we do that? Honesty is sexy. You know? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Real talk. Is it, though? That's a whole other conversation. Let's <laughs> make <laughs> it sexy. Okay. <laughs> so I just, I just want to kind of go back to something that you had said, Kondra. Like, how can we make stigma? Like, how can we free ourselves of stigma? Because I think that is so deeply rooted in us as a culture for certain things. Like, even me, as liberal and liberated as I try to be, I have a hard time talking about sex sometimes in certain circles. I have a 14-year-old son. <laughs> if I'm going to bring up any sexual part, I mean, any private part, is going to be, like, textbook 
uh, language, like penis, you know, and stuff like that. And he's looking at me like, you're a weird mom. <laughs> like, who says penis? <laughs> but, but that's just how I am. And I, yeah. I think of myself as being liberal, but I still don't feel that level of comfort mm-hmm. talking about sex so openly and so candidly as as some people might. Mm-hmm. It's just something that's very... I'll give you, give you guys an example. As grown as I am, if I'm sitting in a living room with my father and we're watching a movie and I know a sex scene is about to come on, I'm going to get up and leave. <laughs> <laughs> we used to do the same thing. Yeah. She's like, oh. I don't want to be sitting in a long, slow-mo <laughs> hey, on somebody's back while Dad's sitting here. And he- heavy panting. <laughs> what do you look? Um, yeah. Maybe also change the channel for dad. And that's fine. I'm not going to pretend that I'm always super liberal enough to like, I'm getting there. I'm having more conversations yeah. with my own parents and uh, that's okay. Uh, but outside, yeah, I'll talk about sex all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm probably the most liberal out of the whole bunch. I don't have kids yet, which helps, but <laughs> I talk to my parents about everything, and I'm like, you scared? It's okay. Let's talk. So <laughs> hence this platform, and, and I really love just bringing that to the table of, like, what do we do when we're speaking to our children? And I love what you brought up, Quandra. I never considered the effect that the prison industrial complex has specifically on Black sexuality. Mm-hmm. Like, this is something I've seen time and time again. You know, women, pen pals, you know, you love a man, he's been through a lot, he's in prison, he gets out, you know, like, you can save him, mm-hmm. you can change him, whatever the story is. And... And also, um, it's been tied to the heroin crisis, yes. which, of course, was um, much more prevalent in impacting our communities, but no one cared until mm-hmm. middle-class white people were also mm-hmm. dying. Yeah. So that that's usually the story. And that's not to say that someone of a middle-class background, never touched drugs in their life, can't also get HIV. And when we talk about m- removing the stigma it's continuing to talk about it in general and getting the narrative changed. Um, So I love in general that we're coming to being more open around mental health. You've got celebrities talking about it left and right. I see commercials before NBA games Mm -hmm. of like, you know, celebrities, uh, athletes saying how therapies help them. You have Rihanna giving a shout out to therapy for black girls and Solange. And so the more that happens, I think there's this new generation up and coming that doesn't have the same shame of like, I need to go to therapy or find a support group. Um, there's a, this Generation Z or whatever we're calling the next one under that. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Uh, I think as Black people, we are equally on board as the general population with what mental health awareness and therapy can do for us. Um, We're just presented with an extra layer of barriers with getting access, like maybe what's available to you is a clinician who doesn't look like you, and then you're worried about a microaggression or having to educate them about whether or not your experience is real. Like if you want to talk about racism at the workplace and how that's making you depressed, and then your therapist tells you, I've heard horror stories. I would never say this. But your therapist may tell you something like, oh, are you sure that's what's happening? Have you considered your boss's um, perspective or something like that? And you're like, no, I was actually pretty sure that that was racism or something. Mm -hmm. So I think those are um, added issues we deal with. But the stigma we're definitely breaking down in general mental health things. Just I don't know that we get there as fast with sexuality. Um, Um, thank you. Thank you. I love that. And um, and to address what you were referring to earlier, Maya, regarding like speaking within families, one of the things that Mika Shirelles is embarking on is our family division mm-hmm. and creating healing circles for families that focus on ending generational trauma and cycles of abuse. Yeah. So like how to create those conversations in the family unit, starting at a young age and bringing children up with consent consciousness and mm-hmm. eradicated shame. Like, what does it mean to raise healthy children? 
Um, I'd also like for you to talk a bit about some of the resources that are up right now for the San Francisco AIDS Foundation um, and any resources that you have as well on that. So some resources um, within the uh, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, we, we have a, a, a lot of resources. We have um, things for people who are suffering from some type of substance issue. Um, we have things for trans people, people living with HIV. Um, we have it broken down into cultural categories. So we have like Latino program. We have the BBE, which is the Black Brothers of Esteem. Really? And they're older. They don't necessarily have to be older, but it, it's taken form of older black men who can be gay. They don't have to be. They're living with HIV. Um, and they come together and support one another. Um, we have Positive Force, which I manage, and it's for anybody, a regardless of age, race, sexual orientation, who's also living with HIV. Um, and what I'm trying to actively do now is start a program for women of color, specifically African American women, because we just don't have that mm -hmm. at this time mm -hmm. at the foundation um, to support our women. Because one of my my main things is I don't want our women to live in isolation. Yeah. And I feel just because where we are as a people right now, that's happening. I'm yeah. running into too many men and women who are black living with HIV, and they're all alone. They're by themselves, and they can be surrounded with people, yeah. but they're still alone because they're the only ones who are aware of their own struggle, and they don't have anyone to talk to, to vent, to... Yeah someone who can understand them. So that's something that I am starting. Um, so hopefully that will take shape very, very quickly. I just can't, I have a hard time finding women who's willing to talk to me on a weekly basis. They <laughs> They're like, I ain't trying to They don't want to come. They're, like, they're, they're out there. They're, out there. they're, they're out there. definitely out there. And uh, I will, I will, I will get that. We will get yeah, that. We'll yes. See what we can do to support that. I will too. appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I also want to bring up one thing. I brought my flyer. I don't know. So this is something that's going on. This is um, yep. It's it. This has some history. So it it's called our Plus Seminar, and what it is, it started back in the '80s, and it was a weekend retreat where people living with HIV would come, hang out, chill before they died. That's mm. the history of the Plus Seminar. So that's not really what it is anymore. But it is a, a weekend event still that we hold where we come together, we network, we have presenters that come to, to give education. Um, and our next one is March 28th and 29th. So I would like, you have to register and everybody is welcome to attend. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Where can they register? Online. So if you go to San Francisco AIDS Foundation's website, you can register there for the PLUS Seminar. And then, because we got two minutes, y'all, let me make sure everybody. Quandra. Mm -hmm. So on another day, I'd love to talk all day <laughs> about breaking down stigma for sexual violence and That's partner good. violence uh, and the intersections, the way in which we as black people deal with that a little differently. Like we have the double bind, uh, um, this idea of like I'm black and woman at the same time or queer and black at the same time and maybe like a white person surviving it doesn't have to think about, oh, I don't really want to put another black man in prison. Mm -hmm. Or there's something about, there's an added stigma that my trans partner who's abusive to me is going to face mm -hmm. than if I was just a straight white person. Um, I think those are stigmas we have to break down and know that you're not alone in it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm pretty full, as I said, in practice. If that sounded like you, there are a lot of other talented um, therapists of color that I trust. So I always like people to know about going to therapy for black girls and searching by their state and also the therapist of color directory, which is the Bay Area local um, website for uh, a bunch of black and brown um, clinicians licensed who have openings. So you can always look there for help if you're trying to survive trauma of any sort. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So again, you can learn more about PrEP and the PLUS seminars at sfaf.org. And you can also learn more about the ITCAST on Facebook, 